Right, good morning everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. My name's Beth and I am delighted to be your host for the next hour where we are going to hear from three innovative business leaders from the hospitality industry who have managed to, to find a way to navigate through the current COVID-19 crisis and also we'll be hearing from the creator of a leading edge piece of software that has allowed them to do just that. Now, I think it's fair to say that we all hear stories about how out of every crisis comes innovation and change, but the reality of living through a crisis with a business to run and a livelihood to protect can be incredibly challenging. And a time for many independent business owners where their USP has changed. The USP used to be all around the personal interaction that they were able to have with their customers. And that has changed to now be a USP where their customers need to be able to access their product or their service without any personal interaction. Certainly unprecedented times for many industries full of business owners like yourselves. So this morning we're going to hear from three business leaders that have managed to find a way in their hospitality units to maximise the opportunity of continuing to trade within the communities that they are in and they have very generously given up a little bit of their time this morning to share best practice and some of their experiences um, with you so that you can hear how they've done it and also take away some little nuggets of gold dust. So let's get started this morning. So the first um, business owner that's gonna join us is Gary. So Gary, if I can ask you very kindly to unmute yourself and also uh, put your video on. Um, welcome to the webinar, how are you this morning? Very good, thank you. Excellent, now Gary, you are coming to us from Ireland, from the Boathouse. Can you set the scene for us? Can you tell us a little bit about the business that you run in Killybegs? Yeah, we've recently opened a, a new seafood restaurant in Kelly Beggs. It's Ireland's premier fishing port. Um, we got off to a great start. Everything was going lovely. We got going on the 1st of December and right up until March uh, 15th, I think it was, when we got told we've got to close for a few months. But um, we also have another business, a seafood pack, which is a, a takeaway, kind of an upmarket fishing takeaway. But, uh, so we managed to continue integrating the two businesses uh, keep the head above water so to speak. excellent and how have you um you know what, what's your experience of lockdown be, uh, been did you initially close the boathouse and if you reopen how did you go about that well we had a week where we kind of just loads up took, took stock of what was happening and then i got talking with eugene who uh is a as you know, a web developer, and he was able to come up with a plan for us to get an online ordering portal really, really quickly. Uh, so really, we didn't have much of a gap in our trading. We were able to, to change the whole model of how we operated more or less within the space of a week. Um, it was a very, very quick transition for us to an online business. And so prior to COVID lockdown happening, did you have a takeaway service that you were running in the boathouse? Not from the boathouse, no. It, it was fully seated at a la carte restaurant. Um, so not absolutely no takeaway. We were, we were busy enough the way it was. We didn't need to look to do anything to so complete uh, sidestep for us to get into that market there. So why didn't, why did you, I'm interested to know why you didn't just close the restaurant, sit back, enjoy furlough for a while. Why did you put yourself through trying to create a new avenue to trade with your customers? I think standing still financially was the biggest goal, not to go into a slump. I think too many businesses will show weaknesses after three months of being closed. Um, cost to reopen them would be difficult of finding the energy and the motivation. I found myself more clued into what the market was doing and how people were reacting. I mean, how we traded in March, how we're trading right now, two entirely different situations. It's evolved continuously throughout COVID-19. Um, and I think staying open, being ahead of the game, like we, we're, we're at a huge advantage over the competition in our area because we've never stopped. We didn't lose our customer and we, we've also gained a lot of theirs. So it's their job to win them back now. Yeah, well, they're up against it clearly. And it is interesting because from uh, the speakers that we've got this morning, we'll see evidence of um, the different attitudes towards having um, running your business during crisis and those that stop 
those that get started and those that you know never stopped and that will you know show its its success in the in the future um, I'd love you to share. We've got lots of business owners joining us this morning that are interested in understanding how to um, to use things like a takeaway option and trade differently without incurring massive costs. Is it an expensive way to run a business a takeaway service? It's a lot more efficient. Um, once we got on board with Rhino and we got our heads around it, our customers registered to use it. We were more or less able to predict our business every evening by about three o'clock. Are they able to need to do a little more mise en glass or if we were good? Same with ordering. Did we need to increase the order for Saturday to allow us to carry through Sunday as well? Because people are organized, and if they didn't get the time slot they wanted last week, on Tuesday or Wednesday, they're booking Friday and Saturday for the week after to get exactly what's their day. So it gives you huge efficiencies. It allowed us to cut, like we managed with only one additional staff member uh, up to about, you know. So you could be doing 160, 180 takeaways. So wow. it, you know, it really worked from a an efficiency standpoint, from a top control standpoint. We, we weren't getting left with overruns coming into the the end of the weekend. And were you surprised about how your customers very um, naturally migrated to the use of an online? ordering service um, because normally a takeaway you ring up and um, and I guess you didn't have to experience the chaotic phone lines and human error in writing down the orders and taking payments over the phone did you find your customers adapted naturally to we loved it. It so many compliments on the system it's where we created it you know um, all we did was implement it but it, it really made their lives easier they didn't have to I mean our phone did ring a lot until people got used to using the app, right. we couldn't answer it. We were so busy working, we didn't have the staff to stand on the phone. I remember time in one order, four people's food, and it's, I didn't have a staff member to serve out food or do anything. So when we get the orders through the online system, it's right there on the screen, I, I don't need to waste that time. You know, so you're, you're able to be more productive the whole time you're working. But the customers mm -hmm. loved it, and the, the payment was huge. They, they didn't want to stand at our window. They didn't actually want to be in public in the very peak of the COVID crisis. All they wanted was to get their bag and get out of there. And, and having the prepay, everything was done, just made them more comfortable. It's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, consumer behaviour has changed hugely. And I, I'd love to come back in a moment to mm. see what you think will happen to consumer behaviour in the long term. But interesting hearing you speak about how you were able to react to a new priority of theirs, which is to get access to the food they wanted from your restaurant, but to do it in a way that did not require them to hang around and interact with anybody um, in the actual experience of collecting it. And you had predetermined collection slots, didn't you, that you could then protect people's safety? Yeah, and it, it's different, especially as a chef who's into a la carte food. You know, we, we're not used to doing a 60 minute, maybe breast chicken versus a four minute or a five minute fish and chip simultaneously. I mean, we can do it for one table, no problem. We can do it two for two, but suddenly, that time is repeating every five minutes. You're getting these complex orders coming together from a timing perspective and your box and the late. And so there's a lot. So we went to one order every 10 minutes for a week or so. Then we increased two orders every, every uh, sorry, we went to one order every five minutes then. And then as we became better and more efficient, we increased to two orders for five minutes. Right. You know, without a limit on the size of the order, it could be two people, it could be for 10. And when you when you say about you um, have changed the the pickup slots and the the amount that you're doing, normally with um, any sort of e-commerce site, those those changes need to go back through the um, the actual website designer, and that, that that can be hard to be agile enough to respond in the moment. How did you manage the need to do that? There, there was no issue. Very self-explanatory. I mean. You didn't need any training. I, I, I mean, Eugene, they got the brief run through of it, but you know, you're normally doing six other things. You just can do it. It's so simple to navigate, logical. Um, just read what's in front of you. you, you don't need to start. Because I see from the um, I see from the the website there are tutorials that you can follow, and then I guess on a daily basis that allows you to um, respond to 
your desire to trade and you can change the number of collection slots or you can change your menu and i know there's many people joining us today who are worried about the impact the financial and the profitable impact of streamlining their menu did you you know what what would your your advice be if someone's worried about streamlining a menu to cope in this oh uh, yeah you really got to look at getting the, the menu that works within the same time zone like if your average cook time is five and it's build your menu on food like that because right. the pressure comes on and like you don't want to limit it down to every customer can only order for one person or two people. You you get family groups going together now where you get ten or twelve people in a house. So you need to be able to when the pressure comes on, you might get a run of those big tables together. You can still get the food out effectively and get you out of the weeds fairly quick because nice. you know you don't want to hamper your ability to trade. So you've got to structure your menu in a completely different mindset. Stay true to your own food concept. But make sure that you can do it in a, in a shorter time period to what we would be used to doing in a, in a busy restaurant. And so if you have managed then by the sounds of things to continue to deliver what your customers are expecting, they want access to your food, but they want it on their terms and you've been able to create an environment where it's safe for them to come and collect it at a time that they chose paying online so your customer service angle is sorted what has the impact on the the running of the restaurant the the experience for your team um running um an electronic system like that it, they really found it simple there was no mistakes our upsells went up actually um silly little add-ons and saying that you People quite often ask for after the payment's been done at the at the point of contact. You know, uh, <clears throat> you just got your brand new with you. But they're actually pre-ordering. We, we would have seen a, a big increase in side orders, big increase in dips. They're just silly little things, but it amounts to hundreds of euros a week. Yeah. And that's just by it. It's simple. It's logical. We click through it. The customer made the decision, added on. Didn't make you expensive. They added that in themselves. You know. And if people are ordering in advance, I'm guessing for the first time ever, you're getting an absolute clarity on what you need to produce to have ready to deliver and, and collect on certain days. So that must have an impact on wastage and food prep and efficiency and calmness in the kitchen. What was it like? It was, it was very quiet, very, very easy to deal with. I mean, we didn't have food waste. We were... You know, after you get your first couple of weeks of doing it, people are ordering that much in advance. Uh, you really bring it down to the wire. It's it's efficient. It didn't cost us money to trade that way. We wouldn't have waste issues, thank God. Brilliant. Be, and that. the last thing that I'd be really interested for you to share with us, I'm curious about the impact of your reputation because I know that the hospitality industry is relatively unforgiving and your reputation is at risk every day. Yeah. Have you come under um, press interest or have you come under criticism for continuing trade? What's it been like for you? No, it's been very positive. I think we managed it well at the beginning. You know, we did in that, or we made a video, we got a professional guy in who made a video of how we were working with Rhino App right. uh, or Rhino Online, how our process and children do the, the order online, we showed them how they were going to walk into our courtyard, the collection point, and the, the separation of people, you know, it, it really made them feel comfortable, but we, we would have garnered a fair bit of media attention here in Ireland for being one of the first businesses out the gates with right. something that was uh, a wee bit innovative. Uh, the video didn't do us any harm either. And then, I mean, I think there's been maybe four or five national newspapers have covered both the restaurant and the, sea, the, the boat house and the seafood jack various different levels about their ability to trade and trade successfully and safely um within the industry itself our phone or email is popping with with other businesses that are beginning to reopen want to know how we did it what we were doing and how they can replicate it because if because you know you continue to trade and then your online presence was so good and your national media was so good as a result of just being out the gate first yeah it kind of gives you a little bit of um credibility out there that maybe you didn't have before so I mean it's going to increase our business we're getting a lot of their staff coming down now and trying food you just know that they're they're <laughs> educating themselves from our mistakes at the beginning maybe or whatever you want to call it brilliant but, uh, no it's been very positive I, I think it's really put us in a good position for now and, 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 
Ireland. Right. Dolphins are flying in and very, very comfortable the season ahead. And we continue to bring them now in a more structured way into our business. We, we limit the time stop. Uh, you know, at the a la carte, we're going to have again, but we'll be able to maximize our seating by using the seats in somebody else's house. We don't have to have them in the restaurant. Brilliant. And so the the extra dimension of trade that the app has brought into your world, you don't see that ending at no. the end of lockdown. It will just no, be an no. additional way to trade. Yeah. People like to trade online. They like to buy. They're comfortable with it. I think the more penetration Rhino gets in an area, the sorry, right. more seamless it will become. <laughs> We Sorry. can see your, your real inaction. Love it. I don't even know. It won't switch off once it's on. Sorry. Um, That's fine. So you think people like and want will want going forward that that social media element and the instant access to your menu and the collection. Yeah. Not something you're going to stop. No, you've still got families. I mean, what we're seeing now is we've got people that maybe somebody had a recent heart attack either before COVID, after, or maybe they're suffering from cancer and they're. They, they still want to have a family. They, they feel safe right now because our you know um, level of COVID is so low in Ireland. They feel really safe to come together as a family unit, but they don't feel comfortable coming to a restaurant exactly at the moment. So like we're going to see an awful increase in uh, proper, nice a la carte food again, going out to houses where they can have their whole house experience, but in a real safe environment. And that's where the app is going to allow us to do that. But it'll allow us to control the time they want. They can't have it at eight thirty. Incredible. Time, but they can have it at six, six thirty. The public have a bit to do here as well. They've got to manipulate the way they think about dining out and dining in. Well, so, I think you know we'll see consumers make the choice based on quality and also safety and convenience. So, Gary, thank you so much for joining me this morning to share your experience and. Um, I look forward to the continued press coverage that the Boathouse has got and, um, and seeing you move through the next phases of lockdown. So thank you so much for joining me. If I can swap you for one of our other speakers, I'll ask you to turn your microphone and camera off. And I'm hoping that Peter will be able to join me. Um, so we're gonna move now from a fishing village in Ireland to deepest, darkest Croydon. So good morning, Peter, how are you? Good morning, fine, thanks Beth, you? Good, I'm very well. So yeah. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Can you paint a little picture of the business that you've got running in Croydon? Tell us how long it's existed, who your clientele are, so we can get a feel for what you're facing. Okay, well I, I've been there for 30 years now. I took an old gymnasium on, rebuilt it, built my own sort of dream restaurant that I've wanted to do for, for forever. I mean my family's all Italian we've all been in restaurants and catering so started up 30 years ago and it's gone in a flash and you know we've been through been through a few recessions and ridden all of those uh, this latest uh, this latest situation really takes the biscuit I was going to say uh, does this feel different than the recessions that you've experienced because it you know it's fascinating someone 30 years in that restaurant and been able to, to you know to, to survive does this feel different yeah completely i mean it was um it was shocking obviously when it all when it all happened um we actually closed our doors um on i think the 20th of march or 23rd of march something like that we could have stayed open we could have carried on doing takeaways and deliveries but you know at that point we were worried for our staff and their families and staff are very anxious so so we closed the doors for a little while um closed for seven weeks Right. Probably, I must say, best seven weeks of my life. But you know, life. I guess I bet you slept well. Yeah, no, it was fantastic. Just had time to cook every day and <laughs> you know, catch up with the family and catch up with my life. So it's, you know, it's the first proper break I've had in thirty years, which was great. But you know, as Gary was saying earlier, you know, financially you get to a point where you can't stand still, and there's still fixed costs to meet. So we uh, we decided that we had to to um, to, to restart delivery. How and did you away. how did you take those first steps to restart your business, Peter? After seven weeks, uh, spoke to all my staff. Uh, just made sure that you know a small amount of them were happy to come back, come off furlough, and and restart working. 
uh, we had already been doing um, delivery and takeaway service, um, which was quite antiquated. It was all on the telephones and all writing notes on bits. I bet of that was a joy on a Friday night and a Saturday oh, night, wasn't it? Oh, an absolute, absolute mare because it had become really busy over the years. So um, we had one person, just one employee on the telephone all night long. So thankfully now that's, you know, with the Rhino app, that's eradicated now. I mean, that's been... But that complete... has replaced that functionality, has it? Do you yeah. run the takeaway and, and the delivery service and from the, the app? And, and the delivery, yeah. I mean, it's, it's been amazing for us, really. We, we can put the, uh, put the message out to all our customers, whereas in the past they'd have to phone us, wait till the phone's not engaged, uh, speak to someone for about five or ten minutes about a menu and then of course you've got you know a great chance of uh, miscommunication and you know most of my staff are Italian and pretty much all of them can speak pretty good English but you know things don't do get lost in translation uh, with the app it's you know it's foolproof everything is there in black and white there's a, a nice colorful picture of the dish as well for them for them to see and they'll just go on book their time slot book their meal, write any notes of variations of dishes or, you know, it's the third bell on the right hand side <laughs> of uh, the side door or whatever it, right. whatever it might be. I think it's been, uh, yeah, I mean, for us, it's, it's completely changed the way we work. And so have you followed the same system that, um, that Gary was talking to us about? You've selected dishes from your menu, so streamlined your menu, put photos and descriptions on, it allowed decided when you want collection slots or delivery slots and people have gone through and they can self-service online is that what you've done yeah. pretty much yeah i mean it's really the, the app's really flexible to change your time slots and you know maximize them minimize them however you want to do it we've actually kept a whole menu going so i've right. had quite a few um chefs back on back on duty um the great thing is as gary was saying is you know if you've got sort of peak times that you want to extend the time slots um, times where you want to do it the other way around. It's very flexible and very easy, easy to use. And uh, as he was saying, you know, it takes very little tutorial. Um, we looked at the videos that uh, Rhino have put online. Uh, myself and my managers looked at that. Eugene has been on the end of the phone to, to give us some advice and tweak things for us. Um, it's, it's been amazing and it's been really, really easy, easy to use. And, and how long and did it actually, time. how long, sorry to interrupt you, Peter, how long did it actually take for you to go from, we're going to use it to be up and running? Did you onboard yourself or did you take uh, Eugene up on the offer of his team onboarding um, all of your menus? Did you do it or did he do it? Um, he, he loaded the menus up and then we added and changed things that we wanted to change, put the photos on. And we were pretty much done in a, the next day, I think. I think the next really? day we started started using it. And then, That's of course, fast, we got to, isn't it? Oh, it was amazing. It was amazing, really. We um, had to get the information out to our customers, but you know, through social media and uh, our own databases, we got that over. And, and how have they responded? Oh, they they love it. They absolutely love it. Um, there's still the odd one that wants to phone up. I think they mostly want to phone up for a chat, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think 99.9% .9 of people want to order will just want that ease of ordering. And I think a, a really important factor is, you know, we're up against um, people like Deliveroo and Uber Eats that we do use as well, that we've used them for years. And I think a great thing that Rhino is doing is eradicating the choice that the customer has to use them. So it was in, in the past, they might have to thought, right, okay, I've got a phone, phone up Bugatti's, uh, it's engaged, I haven't got time to speak to someone, listen, I've got a delivery app, let's just click on there. Now they've got the Rhino app and they've got the choice to go directly onto our website or off our Facebook page. And it's slowly getting, we've noticed the numbers of delivery are definitely diminishing and the numbers on our Rhino is definitely increasing. And that's really interesting. So what does that do to your profitability and your bottom line? Because there's a, the, the cost structure of having using a delivery company like delivery is very different to the cost of having the Rhino app, which is more profitable for you? Oh, the Rhino app all, all day long. Um, the, I think delivery, they charge anything from 28 to 35 percent. Right. Which is, uh, which is massive. So the only cost that I have now is my own drivers or people will come and come and collect. So that's a much 
much that's a much lower cost so do you does rhino charge you per delivery oh no it's just a basic i think 30 quid a month i mean it's you know so it's, 30 pounds whether you're whether that's allowing you to do satisfy 30 customer orders or 300 customer orders unlimited no um, wonder that you're smiling this morning then peter yeah. that must be saving you a fortune <laughs> yeah why isn't everyone doing it <laughs> yeah well there we go yeah who knows exactly. and what has um what's the impact been inside the the workings of the restaurant the books the bottom line the profitability has trading like this allowed you to cover the, your costs um and is yeah. it something that you can sustain yeah absolutely i mean there's so many advantages to it there's the first advantage is we're not on the phone all day uh, the other advantage is we're getting time slots booked in advance. So my chefs are very happy because, say, we've just been through Father's Day where I, I think we served probably about 220 meals, something like that. They've got everything the day before. They know how much of sea bass, steaks, pizzas uh, that they pretty much need. They've got a great start and it helps with the service. Customers are happy. They're getting their their deliveries and collections on time. Uh, we're happy because, you know, we're, we're spreading out with our time slots. We're spreading out the cooking out over the whole day. So um, profitability, it's better because there's less wastage. Um, we know how many staff we need because we've got orders in advance. Uh, yeah, I mean, it has, it's been a massive change for us. And then what about the next phase as July comes and yeah. restaurants can reopen? Obviously, there'll be a new kind of phenomenon, the in-house dining. Yeah. How, are you, how are you planning to, to manage that? It sounds like you've got your, your deliveries and your takeaway sorted. How are you going to manage in-house dining? Yeah, well, we've got to, um, we're, we're giving a, a, a meter space that we've been right. told to do. Um, we've got to be COVID uh, appliant, which I think any restaurant, bar, cafe that's reopening, must do that because um, that needs to be distributed to your, all your employees. Uh, if the environmental health come in, they're going to want to see it. And also you, you're going to need it to give yourself that direction of um, all the hygiene procedures that need to be in place. And are you intending to use the, the ordering facility that is already on the app that you're using for your deliveries? Does that, will that allow people to not have to use disposable menus and things like that or will you go back to table service and everything yeah we're not sure we're hoping we're hoping table service but then there is you know we've now with the rhino app we've got that in place you know if that's a directive we get from our government that, that that's what we have to do we've already got it there so someone can pick up the app look at it send it off to us we'll we'll pick it up um in front of them on, on our own phone or or tablet and uh, and we're away so if, if we could probably use it both ways we can use it for people that are a little bit anxious about you know handling menus and being too close to a waiter um or we can we can go and use the old the old method and i think also you know the rhino app hopefully will be doing the reservation system as well and that all can be integrated uh with the same app straight off our website straight off our no Facebook extra page as well sounds of things yeah yeah, and again, you can spread your bookings out and block off times that you don't need and uh, and have different time slots on different days. You're going to be future-proofed tightly. Yeah, well, we're, we're, working, we're working towards it. And, and it's amazing, actually, that this situation has really changed the way so many of us have worked. You know, I'm sure we would have plodded along, leaving someone on the telephone every Friday and Saturday night, uh, chatting to people and getting the odd hiccup with a, with a misinterpretation of a dish. Uh, now, I mean, you know, this is for sure, we'll carry on using this. It's going to be and, very helpful. And it's really interesting, Peter, because one of the biggest hurdles for independent business owners to um, adopt new technology or new ways of working is the fear associated with the change. Um, yeah. What advice would you give? to somebody who's listening in today and is trying to work out how they can navigate reopening have they got anything to fear not, not at all uh, i mean all i'd say to them is have a look at it now you know don't wait until you're open and think oh i wish i'd i wish i'd done that the phone's ringing and you know we can't we can't cope with um with what we've got to deal with have a look at it now um you won't be disappointed i've been in in the restaurant business for 42 years now uh, this is, you know, it's been a massive change for us. It's going to save on staff cost. It's going to save on your time. It's going to save on hassle on 
mistakes on orders that you then have to go back over again. Uh, but I would say get prepared now before before you're opening, or if you're open, take it straight away. We started we started it within a day or two. That's incredible, isn't it? Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me this morning, yeah. Peter. And um, I look forward to hearing of Bugatti's continued success in London. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to so bid cool. you farewell. And okay. thank you for sharing your advice. It's been brilliant. So if okay. I can ask you to turn your video and microphone off and to be joined by the last hospitality industry specialist, Paddy, if you would mind turning your microphone and your video on, because Paddy is joining me all the way from Nailsworth today um, from the olive tree. So Paddy, good morning. How are you? Extremely well. Thanks, Beth. How are you doing? Good, I'm fine. So look, we've, we've gone from the shoreline of Ireland to central London, and now we're going to end up in some beautiful countryside with you. Would you like to help the, uh, the audience today understand what the olive tree is, who your clientele is, where are you, what yeah. are you doing in business? Happily. Well, we're in a beautiful market town of Nailsworth, which is uh, South Cotswolds. We've been there for 16, 17 years now, running a Mediterranean restaurant and pizzeria. Um, but we operate very much as a coffee shop uh, from early mornings through to lunch and then bistro in the evening. Uh, fantastic following, um, extremely loyal customers. Um, you know, you can sort of put a time on the day with who arrives through the door with oh, what I coffee they're that. having. So it's very much first name basis all the way. And so if you've got, if you've been trading for all that time in a community, what, what did the community expect of you in lockdown? Did they put pressure on you to find a way to trade? Have they been okay with you not trading? You know, it's, it's like one big family uh, down, down in Nailsworth and, uh, you know, everyone looks after one another and everyone's concerned for families. Um, so I think, you know, during the early stages of March, um, it was horrific to see. It was like business fell off the edge of a cliff because people were scared, you know, and, and rightly so at that point. Uh, and we were hanging in there by the by the skin of our teeth. But obviously, being an operator, you were you were public enemy number one for the staff because the hours weren't there. Um, but yet, as the, as that final week progressed towards the takeaway, um, it just got busier and busier and busier. Uh, Boris's announcement on that Friday night that we had to close uh, from Friday night onwards, but only operate as a takeaway uh, or, or delivery. Um, the love we felt in the town building up that week, we had, if it was a normal evening in the restaurant, we would have operated and turned over three or four times. Um, we'd gone from serving just the restaurant to, to the Shire. Wow. And so there's a, there must be a real desire for you then to get back to a new normal and service those community of people who sound as if they're using the olive tree as an essential part of their, their, you know, their country life. I mean, what, what, how are you feeling about reopening and, and what, what does it look like for you in the olive tree at the moment? Well, I think um, certainly as, as, as Peter had said in the, in the early weeks, I had a terrific break. It was, you know, it's hard work running a business. So to, so to have that time off, um you know from from decision making was superb um that being said you know we, we were in a strong enough position to obviously furlough the staff um and just to take stock of where we were at but you know as, as peter did say you know i started implementing procedures early on um so that there wasn't this final rush uh, and we kept in touch either on the phone uh, with your customers because you know them well or, or by social media. So the fact that we were deep cleaning, the fact that we were changing, the fact that we were putting up screens and implementing all these decisions weeks ago um, has helped the community um, with their confidence because I think moving forward, it is all about customer confidence. Um, and that, do you think that that safety angle will be a, a strong determining factor on where people choose to eat and have coffee when they feel comfortable to come out? Paramount, absolute paramount. You know, I have had one or two takeaways over over the, the you know the COVID period, and and, it, and it's gone from having a you know an A4 written bit of paper on the window um, 
to you know to, to other measures um for us you know I, I start with you know sanitizers on external doors that sets the scene you know and people are aware of that um through the through the website they will see images as to what we've done so prior to arrival they know what to expect mm. and so have you how have you integrated or preparing to integrate the technological side of business we've heard both from gary and from yeah. peter that not only does society expect the convenience of distanced ordering but also they they want to have um, a safe in-house dining experience how have you embraced new technology i think um you know, from the outset, both Peter and, and Gary sort of, you know, uh, highlighted it. Um, and it's, it, there will be one option, uh, you know, as to whether or not a customer wants to, you know, have a, have a, a one touch menu or ideally, you know, the next stage of Rhino Online is the in-house dining, you know, so from our uh, perspective, they would go onto our website and there will be a, you know, an order online, a phone or in-house dining. So throughout their, stay with us they can order another bottle of wine they can order a coffee um, it the hospitality horizon has changed you know um, i hope it does return I, I really do and i think um both peter and gary have obviously nailed all the highlights you know the great points with rhino online with you know running as a takeaway and a, and a delivery um that you know the, the biggest part now is going to be the in-house dining but what's terrific about the technology we have with with rhino is the fact that yes we can we can increase in-house dining early on in the evening and later in the evening and perhaps block out that key takeaway time of your business um to increase sales and, and push sales throughout the whole evening so ultimately You've lost covers in house, but hopefully, as, as as a business, you can recoup those costs by you know educating the public and and spreading out your business o over the course of the evening. And it's obviously going to be, um, and you're very passionate about the industry that you work in. Do you think um, we will see in the coming months and and throughout next year this real division between successful hospitality based? businesses those that adapted to change and took steps versus the ones that will no longer be able to find a viable way to trade because the old model just doesn't work anymore do you think it, that will happen it, 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 i think it's inevitable to you know to a point and, and it will come down to the to the organization or the business owner um you know as to, as to how they do change um rolling stone gathers no moss you know it's you you've got to adapt um you know in in this environment or yes you will get left behind but the customers will vote you know the customers will vote with their feet you know as they always do um you know and i certainly think things like TripAdvisor um more so historically has always been about the experience uh, and certainly that's going to be a strong part of it but people are going to be looking very much at your covid um you know operation um and how safe you are you you know heaven forbid you get a bad report on that front that's not going to do you any favors let alone if your sea bass is slightly overcooked that's it that's, that's the challenge though isn't it in yeah. in a world where your customers can show an instant like or dislike for their experience you, you've got nowhere to hide because with social media platforms and uh, TripAdvisor and Twitter they can instantly show the world what you're doing wrong as quickly as you're doing right so that's a lot of pressure how are you going to take the the customer experience because I know from your website there's such a community feel how do you think you can replicate that when people have got to be a meter apart and they're ordering from an app or a a disposable menu do you think you can still hang on to the the ambiance of the industry you've got no choice so you've got to give it your best best shot um i had no insight um but you know six weeks ago i, I set up the entire restaurant based on a meter because if it was any more than that it, it really wouldn't be worth operating so it's, it's very much been based on that it's you know it Potentially, it could lose the, the, the buzz, the feel, the atmosphere, the ambiance, you know, the experience that people want when they go to, to their favourite, um, you know, favourite restaurants. Um, so, you know, we will give it our very best shot, but things have changed beyond recognition, you know, and I understand that um, aside from having to give details on arrival at, at a restaurant, 
uh, tables that would normally have been set with glasses and cutlery and condiments, et cetera, et cetera, um, have all going to be removed. Um, you know, so we're going to, you know, we're, we're very much in it together. Um, and it's very much a case of, you know, educating the public that when they do go out for dinner or they do go to the pub, expect changes, you know. Um, but we, we, you know, we'll do all we can to, you know, to generate that atmosphere. I think ultimately, you know, people buy from people and it's how we train the staff, you know, uh, and how they engage with the customers. Um, we're all learning to walk again. You know, we used to be in, a, a, in an industry where the busier it got, the bigger the buzz. Uh, you know, we all enjoy multitasking, whereas now you have to, you know, rein that in, follow procedures. So, you know, time, time will tell, but I think the technology needs to be in place. And I think with Rhino, we've got an opportunity to, you know, to, to survive. And so a final piece of advice for anyone listening who their main concern is either that embracing technology to facilitate continuing to trade, either the fear is associated with it either be expensive, difficult to launch and onboard, or it will malfunction and it will complicate things beyond a level that they can cope with. Any advice as to how to, to take that first step? Stay calm. Keep calm. You know, Keep trading. Think, 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 yeah, things will, that, you know, it, it, it's, it's changed, it's technology, things will happen along the way. Um, you know, I had, a, I had a dry run with my thermal printers last week and it fell offline, uh, which could have been crucial during a Saturday evening if you couldn't get those off. But you, you'll work through them. You have to. You've, you've got two choices. Um, either either, either sell or take the key to the front door with a good luck card uh, <laughs> or, or give it your best shot you know, um, but be confident because I think you've got people out there that, that can support you. You're not, you're not alone. Um, you, you know, invest the time now, as, as, as Peter said, get on with the changes now. Um, try and do a few dry runs, iron any problems out, maybe get some staff, some friends ordering just to, you know, do a few dry run evenings. You can do it. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Paddy. I'm going to end our little slot there. Thank you so much. And um, next time in the Cotswolds, I'm going to look you up and come for coffee at the Olive Tree. Thank you so much for joining me. So I'm going to ask you if you wouldn't mind turning your video and microphone off. And I would like to in, uh, invite our last speaker this morning, uh, Eugene Blaine. If you would, here he is. Hello, Eugene. Good morning. How are you? Hi, very well. Thank you. So Eugene um, uh, is the creator, CEO and founder of Rhino Apps. So Eugene, you must be, it must be, well, I, I assume, is it strange is the question to hear real stories about people using the software that you've actually created? How does that feel? It's, it's very interesting and it's, it's very humbling because um, I spent uh, 25 years in the corporate world building systems for the big banks and uh, pharmaceuticals and so on um, and you don't often see the results of that um, but when you uh, when you hear real you know business owners and it's all very much at the coal face it's all very real uh, it's people's jobs it's people's livelihoods it's people's families um, yeah it's it's really nice to hear that's superb. So you mentioned um, a background in the corporate world. So I'm curious as to where your passion for championing small businesses comes from, because that is has been your focus for years. Yeah. How, where does that passion come from? Well, uh, I come from the same village as Gary back in, in Donegal, and um, it's all small businesses. And um, I served my time on a fishing boat off the west coast of Ireland, um, learned a lot about business on a fishing boat. Um, and you can apply it to this crisis, actually. Um, if you're on a fishing boat, there aren't many people um, that you can rely on. You have to work yourself. You have to trust your team. Um, and, you know, depending on the weather, or whatever, you've got to work your way through things. Um, so I then went to London and uh, I built the Comic Relief Red Nose System for the BBC. Uh, that was my first project. Um, Just a small project then? Yeah, well, that was Back in the day? Project. Um, and interestingly enough, I had, only, I had only six weeks to build that system back in the day. Um, but yeah, it was good fun. And um, I love a challenge. And, um, you know, I've had, uh, so working with the large companies, all my friends run small businesses, my family, uh, they, they all run small businesses. Um, 
and it's fantastic. It's, it's all very, as I said, it's all very real. Um, so I always thought that one day that I would love to be able to help them out because technology is technology. Once you learn technology, it's uh, tables and fields and it's, 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 it's quite boring really. But when you put it all together, it gets quite exciting. So it's how you apply it. And that's the bit that uh, I, I get a buzz out of. Um, so once I, you know, a lot of people asked me in the past if they could use my software, but it was web-based and um, a lot of small businesses are mobile. Um, so we started looking to help plumbers, electricians, and people are out on the road. And um, we had a big sort of light bulb moment. Um, one evening I was sitting in the, in the theater, and I don't go to the theater a lot, but uh, there's one evening and during the interval, um, I looked down and just a whole sea of iPhones and smartphones lit up. And I just realized the penny dropped that, um, those people were holding so much computing power in their hand that if I could build a system that they could use whilst, whilst they were out and about, that'd be incredible. Right. So I just, I just took um, all the experience of um, all of the, all the big systems that you use in a large company to look after your customers, to do estimating, to do finance, to do expense management, to do accounts or whatever. And I had this vision, if we could pull all of that together into one app and make it really affordable, um, that would be quite a fun thing to do. Um, so yeah, I spent the last five years uh, doing that and um, it's been a very exciting journey. So there's loads of positives. It's, it's, um, it's about someone being able to, life's changing and it's about, creating a balance and the number of small business owners that I talked to in the past that um, they were snowed under with paperwork. Uh, they couldn't get an estimate out for a week. Um, and that's, you can't do that in sales. You can't leave a customer waiting for a week. Um, the other very interesting one was, and I, I hadn't envisaged this, they didn't know what to bill the client. Um, so a lot of small businesses struggle with getting invoices out, especially if they employ multiple people because they've bought stuff for different jobs in different stores and so on. So um, it's very exciting being able to create something that's affordable. You can stick it on your phone and it more or less runs an entire um, operation for, for, for a small business owner. And it's interesting because I think until now, there's always been that expectation that big businesses um, have got great tech, world-class technology, because they can afford it. And that if you're running a small independent business, whether that's a florist, a butcher's, a plumber's, a wedding planner's, whatever you're running, that you'll never have that amount of technological or software control because you can't afford it. Whereas what it sounds like you've done is taken what the big uh, businesses have got access to and made it accessible um, to the small business person. But Here's the question. So when you were creating Rhino, I guess that you didn't have some sort of forward moment in time thinking, do you know what? I imagine a time when people might need a social distancing app. No. Rhino was created for a different purpose, but then COVID-19 happened. How did you, how did you spot the opportunity to evolve what you'd already created to well, respond it, to COVID? Uh, I think it's just, um, it's, I've been very lucky to be exposed to a lot of different companies. Um, so one of the things that I computerized about 20 years ago was a textile firm in Yorkshire. And they dyed all the cloth for Marks and Spencers and all the different big stores. And there's some concepts just as controlling the flow of cloth going through the factory. And that's what makes the factory efficient. Um, so... Uh, when I first got a call from Gary, um, and um, I've known Gary for um, uh, qu quite a while, and um, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was distressed, uh, himself and his team were distressed because they had opened up as a takeaway and crowds appeared right. and they wanted to close down again. Just uh, they, were, they, they didn't feel that it was a safe environment for their staff, for the customers. But also, I think as the guys have alluded to, there's a brand thing as well, which is going to become really important uh, going forward. Are people going to feel safe? And that's going to be really important. So um, I quickly knocked together a little prototype, which uh, I pulled together a couple of pieces of technology. And, that, and it was a complete um, 
unknown. We didn't know whether it would work. We didn't know whether the public would sign up to it, whether they would cooperate. As Gary said, that's really important uh, and so on. But we put it live the following weekend after it closed down. And to all of our surprises, it worked. Um, <laughs> now, this is just a lightweight solution. Um, so I spoke to Gary on the, on the Sunday and he said, we're on to something here, Eugene. He said, this, we could keep going if we could make some improvements. So I asked, um, I asked Gary, what would he need? What would the ideal solution? He said, well, I need to be able to put my menu on there. I need to be able to change it uh, live. Um, I need customers to be able to go on and order. Uh, I need them to be able to input notes. I need them to be able to pay. I need that. I need that to appear in the restaurants or a chef uh, and so on. So yeah, he wasn't after much. <laughs> he just described. He just described McDonald's ordering system. Yeah, yeah all of their technology. So um, I um, I thought that was really exciting actually. So we had that conversation six o'clock in, in in Sunday evening. But I love a challenge. So I don't know if Gary knows this, but I was I was up till four a.m. the next morning sketching out exactly how all of this would work. And I've got my development team based in Vietnam and they start work at four in the morning. Uh, we didn't miss a minute. They were on it straight away. And what we we're doing is we we're adding essentially in, in technology terms, we're adding an e-commerce site onto it. Because e-commerce sites are traditionally expensive. Yeah. They take time to create. Yeah. They're not always as agile and as flexible that the the owner can adapt to changes in either menus or availability in the moment. Yeah. How have you managed to get over those challenges with your app? I um, I just we've used um, we've spent five years building up the technology and it's very clever technology. Um, so uh, we were easily able to modify it. But it's not just about technology. It's about thinking in the same way that the guys have all described approaching this new challenge. Technology, good technology, it's not just about the technology, it's about how it's used. Yeah. So designing something and the design, which is why it didn't take five minutes, um, designing it so that it would work in a really user-friendly way was the key, but also designing it so it'll scale. Um, so one of the key design objectives is I have this vision of um, it's not just about restaurants or pubs. It's about the local flower shop. It's about the local butchers. It's about the local craft shop. Yeah. All of them should be able to get online quickly. All of them should be able to trade. Yeah. And um, in the same respect, they're putting pictures on of their product rather than the food. And yeah. allowing people to either collect or have their products delivered. Yeah, okay. yeah. And as you're doing this, uh, as you're on this journey, you sort of start thinking. Then, why are people using? I, I always question things. Uh, why are people using Amazon? And you use Amazon if you're selling things to reach an audience. Yeah, but there's a lot of people trying to reach that audience. But the convenience of Amazon from a consumer is that you can order 24 hours a day. You can just, you know, 12 o'clock at night and you feel like buying something and so on. So it facilitates trade and makes trade really easy. But what I did see out of something bad comes, must come something good. And what I did see is a resurgence in, in community values. Right. Um, so there's, there's now um, people want to support their local businesses. I think there's a new appreciation of it. Um, and I think the ultimate vision behind Rhino is to build something where any business can go online. It's affordable. We're not going to charge a commission because that's like a tax. Yeah. So th that's a tax on your business. Um, so we're not going down that route. We're doing a flat fee. Uh, it's, it's highly affordable. It's built to scale. And that means we can hopefully get communities uh, on, onto the app and um, increase the actual amount of trade within communities. Because I have to say, I was curious because you're, you're describing, you know, I can hear how the, the apps had an impact in the, uh, the olive tree and the boathouse and Bugattis. And you're describing the degree of technology that is behind it and the flexibility and the agility of it. Yet you're offering it at an incredibly either subsidized or generous rate. How, how, how are you intending to keep that like that? Why yeah. are you supporting small businesses 
in that way? Um, I, I think there's I think there's two reasons. One is I think small businesses. Um, there's a couple of reasons why they won't adopt technology. Uh, one of them is they're afraid of technology. Another one is the cost of technology. It's not just the actual cost of licenses, it's the cost of adopting it and the hassle of adopting it. So we've done a couple of things. In terms of the license cost, we've taken that off the table. Uh, working with the Federation of Small Business, um, they've encouraged this and, and, and so on, especially during this crisis, to produce a free 100 edition. And the free 100 edition allows any small business to start using the app for free. And you can have the first 100 invoices or the first 100 orders, uh, first 100 expenses, all free of charge. Yeah. So uh, if I was a, a coffee shop owner listening to this or a small yeah. retailer or a florist, I could, from what you're saying, if I've understood you correctly, yeah. download and onboard my business onto the app. And actually, yeah. I would incur no cost for that until I had got my hundredth and one order. Yeah. Or Correct. One. So, so that might um, that might suit a small craft shop. It might do them six months. You know, right. if you're selling paintings or whatever, it might do a year and so on. If you're a busy restaurant, it might last you uh, one weekend. But it's, it's about getting people back. And it's, it's also we're in a difficult time. Um, and I am very passionate about small businesses. It's, it's, um, it's actually amazing being on this webinar with so many um, innovators, uh, the professionalism, that they've approached this with and that's what we try and do in our trade as well and do you just your vision for the long-term impact of the app stop at uniting um retailers and hospitality with their customers or has the the potential of the app got a further reach yeah well uh, sitting behind and I, I don't know whether gary and peter and and patty uh, realize this but when a customer places an order um, it automatically logs that customer details. Now that's really useful for two reasons. Um, the first reason is the, the business is building up a client database, something that most small businesses don't have. The second thing that it does is there's one little button now that you can switch and it'll start every time you take an order, it'll create an invoice in the background. So now it's starting to do all of your accounting for you. Yeah. So um, the e-commerce the e side that we've built on, that's what we're asking people to use. And we always encourage people to take ba uh, baby steps, but it's future proof in that you can start using all of the other features to do your VAT returns and so on. But we're not going down that route just yet. We're not telling customers about that yet, but that is already there. Customers are already doing their VAT returns. They're already doing all of their accounts and everything using Rhino. Um, but we need to focus on the challenge um, in front of us. And the challenge at the moment, as the guys have highlighted, is very specific. And that's where we want to focus our help. But the other, the other key thing is that the new, you know, the UK government have come out with a, a tracking app and so on. Um, the interesting thing about the Rhino app is when we, if you do collections, if you do deliveries, but also our plan is to do an at table service. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where you can reserve your table. Um, and it's also where you can place orders. Okay. And all of this is channeled into the kitchen. Okay. Mm -hmm. We've got some very exciting ideas about what we could do in the kitchen as well. But, um, but uh, one of the key things is by taking the contact name, of the person placing the order, we now essentially have contract tracing built into the app. And all of this is GDPR compliant already because the app is GDPR compliant. So this means that uh, if anything did happen, you could pinpoint back to a particular time in the restaurant, you could identify everyone else who's in the restaurant, yeah? And you can start the, the, the tracing process. So, um, we're there already, which is great news. So much potential for the app beyond Absolutely. Absolutely. what it's being used for on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm conscious that our audience today are those who are either trading but need to bring in greater efficiencies because it's time consuming or laborious how they're managing to trade, or it's people who want to get those doors reopened for the first time. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give them as we, as we finish this slot together? Uji, what advice would you give small businesses that are worried about adopting new tech or embracing changes like this? It's, it's interesting. Um, I would say, uh, having been in technology for 30 years, um, if I wasn't in the business, I would, be, I would also be nervous of it. 
um, because there's, there's two different types of app uh, on the market. There's the heavy duty, very expensive, normally, uh, you know, be supplied by a really big company and so on, uh, very expensive. But then there's, it's very easy to knock up a little app uh, that does one function, uh, but um, would you actually try and expand the use of it? It isn't there, it's not versatile, it probably doesn't scale, it may not be secure and so on. So I totally appreciate, and I actually have huge respect for businesses that have been reluctant to adopt technology. Um, but our little mission is to technology, just technology, take the technology off the table, get our customers to do the talking for us. Um, we don't advertise. Um, we simply get our customers to use our technology and then we invite them to comment on it. And um, that way you're letting your product do the talking for you. So it's, it's really good. Thank you. And so as a final comment, if somebody wanted to let the product do the talking, how do they... How do they get their hands on Rhino to, for a trial? How do they find out about it? Where do you want to direct um, people to? So there's, there's a number of places. Uh, you can go on to our website. It's probably the best. That's www.rhinoapps.com. That's Rhino as in the animal, rhinoapps.com. Um, on that website, you'll see case studies. Um, there's also tutorials. Um, and the pricing is transparent. Um, and also, uh, you can also sign directly up from there. Now, you can actually get yourself up and running on the app. It's designed, you can actually click and you can register and you can go through the process and you can get yourself up and running. Um, alternatively, if you just want to chat about it, then you can uh, email us uh, um, inquiries at rhinoapps.com. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Eugene. So we have run out of time. Um, there's so much more that I'd love to know, but um, our webinar doesn't allow for that this morning. So I'm going to just uh, say a huge thank you and ask you to turn your camera and your microphone off. Thank you very much. You. So as we round up the webinar this morning, it just leaves me to um, say a huge thank you to uh, Peter, Paddy and Gary, as well as Eugene, who've given up time to join us this morning. And I hope whatever the situation that you're facing in your industry and your business unit, whether that's at home or uh, in a unit to trade, that what you've heard from the speakers this morning is something that will give you confidence that there is hope and light at the end of the tunnel, that there is a way that allows you to trade profitably within the public health guidelines, and also that there are technologies out there that will prevent the fear and the hurdle and the opportunity should be greater than the obstacle of getting on board with some of the uh, technology that we've heard of this morning. So it leaves me nothing more than to wish you successful trading over the coming weeks and months and to thank you very much for joining us today. Goodbye. <laughs>